And welcome back, everyone, from your networking session. This is uh, the session which begins at 4 p.m. on the evaluation of exit programs. And we will just give it a couple of minutes for people to join the session and orientate themselves in this new row of, of parallel sessions. So it's a couple of minutes past four o'clock. Thanks to all of you who've joined us really punctually. Um, I suggest since we've got such a full agenda, we already begin and um, people who are coming in can catch up as we go along. So my name's Rhiannon Williams uh, from the Bremen Ministry of Justice and Constitution. I'll be moderating this session <clears throat> on uh, evaluating oh. exit programs. Um, it's really brilliant to have such a range of fantastic speakers here. So thanks very much in advance, uh, all of you who are joining us from, uh, for this session. And uh, to begin with, I'd like to introduce Fabian Wickman uh, for the first presentation. Fabian. Yeah, thanks for the invitation to speak here. I just share my screen and then I'm ready to start. So I want to speak um, about the radicalization and exit work and our um, experiences um, around this exit work and evaluation. So I'm working for Exit Germany. That's an NGO founded 2000 um, in Germany and we are um, we are, we are counseling people who want to to leave the far right movement and the violent um, right wing extremist movement. So um, I would just give us a short input about our work and <laughs> it started in the wrong way. So and um, for us, the first question is, if we deal with these um, kind of work um, and in, in connection with evaluation, we have to think about what is the main goal of um, the project just in relation to the evaluation. So at first, it should be very clear if we look at these project, um, what is the goal? And for us, I just um, uh, have here our definition of what we understand on exit work. So it's not about uh, just the changing of jackets. Uh, so change your jacket from the far right into a normal mainstream jacket. It's more about um, changing behavior, critical reflection, uh, critical reflection, and also to challenge the old ideology and to change something really basically in their lives. Um, so that is one very important thing because often I have the feeling that people don't really understand what they do. Um, and also people look at exit programs, they have no really idea what these projects um, do at all. And well, if we look at the environment we are in there, you will see there are a lot of topics we have to challenge. It's about the biography, it's about the group um, the people leave, it's about ideology, it's about behavior of the persons, um, and it's about their environment. In a way, like um, they often change the complete environment, um, and it's basically only the comradeship or the violent group um, in which they are, and there are no relax relations to, to other uh, people around. And then we are facing um, things like 
a general polarization in society. We are facing uh, facing criminal behavior from the person himself, prejudices from society, which is saying, okay, I don't trust these people. I don't trust that they want to, to exit. I don't believe in their exit. We are also having something like recruitment from the um, yeah from these um, extremist groups, and uh, in some cases we are dealing with people who are connected to terrorism and extremism at all. And then, if we um, have to to uh, um, yeah we are facing these problems, we have to find solutions for different um, problems um, surrounding this, like the criminal record in relation to. Um, to reintegration for persons or dependencies because people who yeah, spend more than 10 or 20 years in the right-wing extremist movement there are dependencies because they work for someone in the movement they're selling in in, in uh, right-wing extremist shops their their stuff so different kinds of dependencies dependencies we see um and also mentioned um the social relationships because they lost everything and if they exited um there's no one left to 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 speak to to yeah these social um connections um so and going back to the question what is the goal um in general we see a lot of goals and that's just a few of them we see a lot of goals we are facing in the exit work um on the level of clients but also on the next level if we go to what are the, the main goals of exit work at all. So maybe we have the, the one goal of reducing the potential of violence and numbers and actions. Um, we could also have the goal on um, reducing the numbers of actors and members of a group. And then we have the, the question of reducing offenses. Um, that could be also one of the goals of, or is one goal of the access program, programs. And then last but not least, victim protection. And um, I think victim protection in, in two ways. On the one hand, um, we see that these exit work as victim protection for the general society. So um, possible um, victims from groups, from extremist groups. But on the other hand, also people who are in these exit process could be also victims from their old own group so that are also to to yeah to goals on the meta level we are um, challenging in our work of um, the field of exit work and that leads me to to questions on how to to evaluate internally um, and then i go back to the question of an external evaluation but to, to see these kind of changes, to see development, we need in exit work um, really structured and um, case by case um, structured uh, um, yeah, formats to, to manage this. So we developed something like Zadera. It's a structured ad um, for the analysis of the radicalization processes. So it's our internal documentation. So we see the change. Um, we see people are um, developing, but also we see the risks. We see how people are um, are maybe in danger or the people are uh, itself are a danger for someone else. So it's a different um, way to look at. Um, but it's not like a normal risk um, assessment or risk man management tool. It's more also about to, to find ways how to deal with this. That's what we mean with um, structured analyze. So it's just a, a, um, a piece to help the case manager to find um, ways to, to structure their um, counseling. And that um, leads me to the question of evaluation, because we are um, more than 20 years old and we have some evaluation. I think Germany had a quite long history of evaluation in PCBE. And um, some, some bullet points that came in my mind, um, and some are also discussed before. So it's not about if, it's more on the how to evaluate um, uh, pro exit programs. And there are some questions around like um, the in in independence of evaluation. So who is funding the evaluation? Um, who's financing um, the evaluation? Is it more about controlling or is it more about um, qualifying um, the project or the approach? Is it more about um, finding failures? Or is it more um, about um, yeah 
reporting to the donors, something like this. So that is evaluation needs trust. Um, and uh, for this, we need time. So it's also the question how long time they have to evaluate a project um, like this. And for me, it would be interesting to discuss things like, okay, um, that resources for evaluation should be a part of the planning and before the start of the project, not in a way like, okay, um, we have to, to, to do this, so let's um, ask someone who evaluates this project. Because it's always also for practitioners a big problem if you have a small team doing your work and then um, evaluation came and said, okay, we also need some resources of your time because we have to evaluate your project. Um, and that's quite difficult sometimes for um, projects to manage the, the major work and also to, to manage the, the request by evaluators. And I think to discuss this kind of um, how to design the evaluation of a program, which is needed, but from the very beginning, and I think it will start with designing the whole evaluation process, designing the question, designing the pro the possibilities for the evaluators to to go into the project and not only um, looking at some um, goals as i mentioned before because there are a lot of other goals we don't see um, but we have to reflect in, in an evaluation so and with this um, i will jump into the discussion later on just to have a short input um, and i could also give some insights from evaluation we are facing in the past but don't want to steal so much time from the rest of our um, presenters. So um, yeah, thanks. And um, looking forward for a discussion later on. Wonderful. Really, really great presentation. Thanks very much, Fabian. <clears throat> and I can see, so before the session began, um, Heidi said to me that we should start with Fabian. I think that was the right choice because this uh, broad question about what is the goal of exit work. This has really helped to orientate the whole session. So that's a fantastic beginning. Um, and like you say, we've got lots to get through. So I'm excited to introduce Heidi Myberg next. And you can say where you come from and the title of your presentation. Thanks, Heidi. Hi, from my side as well. Uh, my name is Heidi Maybrook. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at Royal Holloway University of London. And in my research, uh, I have had discussions with people like Fabian who do exit works, exit work, and I have researched, do they measure impact of the work? If yes, how? If not, why not? And the aim of this presentation today is to summarize the reasons why participants' progress is not evaluated or assessed. There are a lot of good practices out there, but I think this is something that we have lots to learn from. And I also try to provide some recommendations on how to show um, current gaps. And uh, just a few words about the data. I had semi-structured interviews with uh, 11 intervention providers, including four formers. Um, they come from various fields and backgrounds uh, regarding the country, regarding their worldview, their work experience, and also their title. So their training and the field they are coming from. And what have I found? In general, uh, exit programs who measure uh, or evaluate their work, they either or do it through participants' progress, they keep their eye on how participants are doing, uh, and or evaluation of the program. So this kind of general um, zoomed out perspective. Today, I'll be focusing on participants' progress and not on the things how it is done, but on the things, on the reasons why it is not done. And we can see that there are um, two general categories of reasons um, why uh, at least the people in my sample group decide not to conduct impact assessment. And uh, one core reason is that although a um, person has involved, they have de-radicalized and or disengaged, reintegrated, rehabilitated, uh, uh, practitioners are afraid to give out these so-called guarantees that, yes, this person has exited, uh, de-radicalized, disengaged, uh, because they, they know that these people actually can re-engage and or relapse. And they're afraid that what will happen with them afterwards, uh, with, with their organization, with their reputation, with their funding, etc. So um, they're afraid to share the results or conduct impact assessment in general 
uh, or some are afraid to do it uh, because they're afraid to give out guarantees and promises about possible future uh, future um, events. Um, also, uh, and this is among uh, this is something uh, that is among uh, people who have actually been trained to use uh, specific tools. Uh, there is this lack of trust towards tools that are out there. So um, some people are afraid that um, they know that the tools out there, the methods out there, are not one hundred percent sure. They are not one hundred. People can do mistakes, and they um, they can provide information that uh, might be false. And there are cases when they know that prison or probation officers they work together with uh, to support exit of certain individuals. They use these tools wrongly. So there is this uh, among some uh, uh, some practitioners. There is this lack of trust towards the tools. They want to be very sure, and if they know that tools can be um, there can be mistakes by using these tools. They prefer not to not to use them. Um, and this is again related with the third reason, which is there is this lack of suitable or right tools. Uh, a lot of practitioners see that yes, we would like to use tools. We would like to be more evidence based. We would like to do evaluation and monitoring and use use tools out there. Uh, however, theoretization, disengagement, other to, to prevention processes. They are so holistic and different and so big <laughs> that at the moment there aren't tools that actually grasp the, um, the different momentums and the different processes that take place within exiting the radicalization engagements. So therefore, at the moment, there aren't right tools out there for them. Um, there are organizations who have created their own progress measuring tools or risk assessment tools, uh, but, but um, with some organizations and practitioners, this lack of suitable tools is something that actually um, has created a situation that they are working based on their gut feeling. Um, and the fourth reason that is very much linked with uh, practitioners who are foremost themselves is that uh, there is this low awareness on necessity to do carry on or carry out the impact assessment. Um, and also the tools or the methods uh, that are out there. So they would like to do it, but they simply do not know that they should do it or how to do it. And the fifth reason, which in, in my opinion is the most interesting one, is that um, there is this clash of paradigms. Uh, exit field, exit programs, they are very multidisciplinary. Um, and uh, often such tools that are out there or methods they are um, created by or to credit for um, uh, fields that are uh, within the frame of security field. So uh, for people who work in probation, prison, uh, police, etc. However, especially among uh, exit programs where people join on a voluntary basis, um, the individuals who work there, their background is social work, youth work, uh, psychology. And um, Practitioners often do not want to be uh, or use the same tools as, for instance, police officers use that their uh, clients might hate. They do not want to lose the trust that they have between um, them and their clients. So therefore, they would like to use tools that come from their paradigms or from their discipline. And if we talk about specific tools, uh, there is a lot of literature out there on risk assessment tools. Um, and there are practitioners who use it and uh, who use it during screening processes or during um, needs assessment. Um, however, um, one, um, one interview, for instance, said that, yes, they are aware of the tools, they are trained how to use these tools, but they see that in their practical life, when they're structuring and carrying out exit process, it doesn't give much benefit to use it. Um, so therefore, they do not see the need to use risk assessment tools or this tool um, in particular. And they, it's a similar case with recidivism, which is something that is that we quite often find in the literature. Um, practitioners see that um, recidivism is something you can keep your eye on. However, it doesn't provide information about how the person or how far the person is from disengagement and deradicalization, but also reintegration and um, rehabilitation. And there are similar tendencies to a theory of change and also uh, program evaluation. But what to do then? Um, I see that there are four major agencies um, 
that are linked with uh, exit programs. So we have intervention providers, we have funders, we have policy makers, and we have researchers. And these recommendations are for all of them, or at least for some of them. So more work needs to be done uh, to um, create new tools and systems by researchers, but together with intervention providers and policy makers, uh, so that the inter um, practitioners would be comfortable uh, using them, but also to adjust the current tools and methods that are out there uh, so that the social worker psychologists would like to use the same tools as pr prison or probation officers use and that all of them would benefit from the system. Also, there is this need to increase trust and knowledge towards the tools that are out there and that actually practitioners do benefit from using them. That um, that they will not take their time away, uh, vice versa, they will give them time. And also how to create a system that the evaluation monitoring is part of the general process. And as we function within terrorism studies, there is also this question of how we define terms or the, define the aims and success and failure we move towards, because it's very much linked with, uh, with how to conduct the evaluation, how to monitor, um, because even what my study shows is that even within the same organization, there are different understandings of what is success and what, the, what is the aim we're moving towards. And this is especially with tailor-made approaches. So there is, at least within an organization or within one country, there is this need to come up with or, or move closer towards the same definitions. And all this requires interdisciplinary cooperation but also uh, assessment training, so how to do it, um, which can be uh, done by policymakers um, and provided to intervention providers. And also the, this question of giving guarantees. Um, before starting a program, uh, intervention providers would benefit very much if the policymakers, the funders, talk with them about relapses or re-engagement and uh, like, Will they point fingers or what will happen if somebody re-engages or uh, relapses? How much failures are actually part of the normal process? And this is also linked with reporting principles. So um, how do we report? What are the things that we report? And is this something that actually practitioners can, can use? But thank you from my side and looking forward to your comments and questions. Heidi, that was fantastic. Thanks ever so much. Oh, I'm perfectly on time, as you can hear by my alarm. Um, to the comments and questions, uh, just for everybody else in the room, um, since it's a packed schedule, we wondered whether it was okay to take them at the end of the four presentations, which are going to be made one after the other. But whilst you're thinking of them, feel free to put them in the chat. That's really helpful because the speakers can then also themselves, uh, whilst listening to the other presentations, start to process their answers a little bit. Heidi, what a great um, view of the frontline practitioner you gave us. Um, that was a really valuable insight into why uh, it is indeed that uh, evaluations might not be taken up on the ground. And, um, Again, uh, this issue of trust, which Fabian also touched on, and uh, of multidisciplinary work, even down to the depth of having a new uh, shared vocabulary to go alongside um, shared multidisciplinary tools. So moving um, briefly on now to our next session, um, I'd like to invite uh, Pedro Liberado from IPS and Victor Costa from UBI to give us uh, their story. Thank you. Very good. I'll be sharing my screen. Give me just a sec. Yes. So, um, good afternoon, everyone from Belgrade. Here after a hustle long day on training, also on this topic, um, we'll be presenting um, the results of uh, of an, a research project, part of a research project that handed back in 2021, uh, where we have evaluated, as the name implies, here are different exit initiatives in EU prison and probation settings, and also talking a bit um, uh, about uh, evaluation procedures in charge. So I'll be speaking first. I'm Pedro Librado, Chief Research Officer at IPS, been implementing several projects and PCVE. 
uh, since uh, some years ago. And then Vitor will delve into the details of um, the challenging task on assessing, uh, evaluating success. Um, so it will be divided into these two topics. Um, and we will first pinpoint the results from this empirical uh, study. So uh, uh, initially here, just to characterize a bit our sample, we identified 26 exit practices in our study at the time, uh, from which we contacted 21 uh, uh, directors or implementers of this program and 14 uh, um, uh, programs agreed to take part in our in our study. And here are, of course, the, 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 the provenience uh, of the countries in our project, in our in our research, when there is indeed an overrepresentation of uh, uh, programs applied in the German context. So here in this slide, uh, and considering the time constraints that we have in the session, just here highlighting some um, um, some the different features that we have analyzed in these fourteen programs. Uh, so we uh, uh, we uh, analyze the different duration. And the length period of each one of these uh, of each one of these programs, there there are some some indeed uh, that have a mandatory uh, uh, length of participation, and it's also served to measure success, as Vitor will talk in a few minutes. Um, also, if some programs, uh, as you can see uh, here, um, about the role of ideology, how ideology played, uh, uh, to which extent ideology played. A role in this in the intervention, either more focused on right wing extremism, Islamist extremism, or not considering ideology at all. Uh, the type of intervention, either individual or in group, or with some kind of different activities, was also was also analyzed. Um, and the, and of course uh, um, the the role of family um, and social networks. Are family members involved or not? Uh, what's the uh, what what is the diff what are the different approaches? Uh, that we have found and also and we have seen that also to connect with, with, here with the point of the contact approach which can be more active passive or mediated especially in the mediation approach families are usually the ones that try to connect the individuals on uh, on being involved with in these kind of programs uh, and the and the, i like the benefits for it but uh, i will only focus of course in in these four that you see here in the screen uh, very briefly to highlight some points uh, as we uh, uh, are uh, also find quite interesting the findings that we have analyzed. So, firstly, regarding the type of participation, you know, uh, uh, there can be a voluntary or uh, mandatory participation. Usually, in this in our sample, interviewees show the preference for voluntary part participation, even though that, uh, even though that there are four programs that involve participants under the judicial mandate. But this is quite interesting, the issue of voluntary participation in the programs, as it is quite debatable. What you mean by voluntary participation? And not better than uh, this sentence from here, Mark. Mark is a made-up name due to uh, um, confidentiality issues. But to which extent it is voluntary, right? Uh, of course, the individual participates, but do you want to have what? Because it is asked, do you want to have some benefits on it? Do you want to have one or more years in prison? So, or you can apply to, you can apply to probation early on. So, they, the individuals tend to participate, but the next step and the critical step is to, so to speak, uh, evaluate their willingness to go into this fully harder. In this, puts into also perspective what the already research has shown that. Uh, de-radicalization and will only legitimately sustain if those who commit to the program will do so in their free will. So quite interesting uh, 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 results in this regard. Also, as Heidi mentioned, the, the use of risk and needs assessment uh, is not uh, congruent between the different programs. Only six uh, utilized, uh, published, and validated risk and needs assessment tools with some not using them at all. Uh, so uh, the majority of the of the of the participants who collected this with non unreliable or non validated tools, which can also pose a problem, um, and uh, we are talking about de-radicalization. But even today, I, uh, I I I talked about this here in Belgrade that de-radicalization is not the end; it's rather the beginning. Then then we need to uh, uh, say uh, there is the need to focus the efforts on 
assuring the reintegration and very importantly stabilization in the community and without the structured follow-up and aftercare procedures with only two programs have these structured uh, approaches uh, in our sample of course uh, it's uh, the, the, the stabilization of course can be can be hindered and the final point evaluation um, and we have noticed that uh, uh, the, the, the qualitative indicators are generally the ones used, but they most re mostly rely on practitioners' perceptions regarding the participants' favorable or not so favorable evolution throughout the program implementation. In quantitative terms, uh, we can say that there is little to no evidence that the program have worked as only three used quantitative indicators, even though that recidivist rates are, should not be the only ones in, uh, being, uh, being uh, on top here as Heidi also mentioned, and as Vitor will mention uh, in the next slide. And there's also this quote from Household Mark, let's call him that, that uh, we also do not have a big enough population uh, to assess the effectiveness of the programs and to ensure that it actually could work in this particular case. Yeah. And with that, with the challenge that's for success, I will leave to my colleague Vitor. Go ahead, Vitor. Yes. So. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, following what uh, Pedro was mentioning, and I will also try to bridge uh, some of the previous presentations, uh, on these following slides, I will uh, talk about the challenges on uh, evaluating these interventions and specifically on defining success. So um, why is it challenging to and difficult to define success? First of all, there is a high variability in the content of, of these interventions. Uh, Pedro skipped that slide because of uh, time constraints, but we observed, mm -hmm. for example, that we um, have uh, very different interventions such as one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling, mentoring, psycho psychotherapeutic rehabilitation, among other possibilities. So there's a high variability and uh, it's not easy to compare uh, them all. Um, this variability calls for a tailor-made, a personalized approach, which also limits the potential comparisons between the different programs. Another problem is that even a well-designed intervention can fail for other reasons than the intervention itself, such as political or cultural aspects. And um, all of these factors uh, result in the attribution problem. So um, sometimes people disengage from violent activities because they are disillusioned with the group strategy, for example, as we know, and not necessarily because uh, of the changes that were uh, produced uh, due to the fact that they engaged in the um, program. We can thus identify uh, three main, um, three main uh, uh, difficulties in defining success. Uh, next slide, please. So, we can find design, analytical challenges, and practical challenges. In what concerns design uh, challenges, um, evaluation tends to focus on the process. So uh, whether the activities that were planned were conducted or not, if they were completed or not, but usually there's limited evidence about the actual change in the participants. And Fabian talked about observing changes, and I think we can discuss this after the presentations. Um, that this is the key aspect to evaluate the effectiveness of a, of a program. There are analytical challenges related to the attribution of change to the programming efforts due to the multitude of factors affecting this engagement. Um, there's a lack of agreed metrics on program success and the impossibility of measuring a negative effect. That is, we do not know what will happen if the program wasn't implemented. Uh, also because we cannot um, withhold these services from people that need to um, uh, be involved in these, in these programs just to have a um, control group. So this will not be ethically acceptable. And we have practical challenges related to the identification of uh, control groups, the lack of robust secondary data uh, to triangulate against and the um, security challenges when accessing the data. So on the next slide, uh, we can see that previous research already um, suggested some markers of success. Um, for example, no reoffending, meaning the lack of recidivism from participants, 
a successful reintegration into society, the development of a more balanced identity, pro-social and non-offending identity, and facilitating alternative ways of addressing the social and political concerns expressed by uh, the participants in these, in these programs. So these success indicators on the next slide, we can see that they can be divided uh, considering the program goals, the time, the participants, and the economical aspects. So when we consider the goals of the program, we know that the exit initiatives will have disengagement and or de-radicalization goals, but also they ultimately aim at rehabilitate and reintegrate the participants. So if the program goal is to disengage participants, changes in participants' behavior should be observed as, um, as a success uh, indicator for disengagement. Other indicators are related with time, such as the longevity of the, of the program, for example, the long-term impact of the intervention. We have other indicators related with the participants, such as the number of participants that the intervention is reaching, the percentage of participants that finish the intervention and the recidivism rates, and aspects related to the economical um, of the of the of the program, such as the financial sustainability of the intervention and its cost effectiveness. On the next slide, and I found it really interesting that uh, Ivy previously mentioned that um, we might have different perspectives even within the same organization about what success uh, entails. And so this is a very interesting question. So who decides what is success uh, in, these, in these programs? Um, which perspective will we follow? The perspective of the case worker, of the stakeholders, of the organization that runs the program, of the participants considering their satisfaction with the program. So there's a lot of decisions to be made in what concerns um, the evaluation of these of these programs. So what consequences does the definition of success have for the evaluation, its outcomes, and the future implementation of the programs? Uh, I would say that it is key to define success, to be able to measure it, first of all. And we should have clearly defined program goals that led to success indicators and ultimately to evaluation themes. Um, and we also need to know why are we evaluating? This question was already addressed also. Are we evaluating to fine tune the program, to decide on the program continuity, um, to show the results to the funding agency, for example, to choose between different programs? We can have multiple uh, reasons why we are evaluating the program. To finalize, we can also look at failure as um, an opportunity to learn from our program. And the fact that we usually uh, found, find um, uh, research results uh, that are always positive and that recidivism rates are extremely low might be the cause for some skepticism, as um, Daniel Collard uh, mentioned. So we have um, to uh, also show how we handle uh, failure and learn with unsuccessful cases and um, ongoing evaluation of cases is also advised. So that being said, our conclusions uh, are that success in the field of exit programs is hard to define. Uh, qualitative and quantitative indicators can be used. Practitioners should be trained on the use of risk and needs assessments uh, so that we can have valid indicators regarding participants' change. Multiple methods should be employed, such as interviews, validated risk assessment tools, observation, among others. And uh, the involvement of stakeholders in programs evaluation is key to conciliate the different views. Before saying um, uh, goodbye to our, to our participants, just in case you're interested, you can find um, it's uh, freely available on the Journal for Deradicalization. Um, from fall 2021, our paper, One Size Does Not Fit All, exploring the characteristics of exit programs in Europe. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Victor and Pedro. That was a really uh, great uh, romp through the main characteristics of exit initiatives and success and failure.
Um, I can see, thank you, Emma, for the first questions in the chat. That's um, great news to see that uh, you're using that. So anybody else who wants to jump in the chat and give um, our speakers, our three speakers who've already done their presentations, a chance to think about um, what you're thinking about, that would be great. Um, and otherwise, I will move on to our final presenters who um, come from Radar Avis, and it's uh, Fena Kaja and Martin Vanderdon. You have the floor. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Martin, could you possibly help me share the screen or otherwise I will do it? Let me attempt. Um, it's not working here from this side now, so please. Okay, then I will do the attempt. Okay. Mm. You need a hand, Fenna? Yeah. All right. I don't see it at the moment. Mm. It worked before we tested it, but that's... we tested it, but it's, it's always it's like that. We need it now. <laughs> yeah. Hold on one minute. Well, well, perhaps otherwise, while Fena is trying to get the PowerPoint started, uh, already contextualizing this, we are going to present an evaluation we conducted. Uh, for the LSA, which is the Dutch um, the Dutch Expert Center on Extremism. Um, and they have uh, several products. And two of the products they have is the family support and the exit programs. And we were asked uh, to evaluate those on effects because <coughs> already the facility had been evaluated on the process uh, two years prior to this. And now they were really curious how effectful are we? Um, and uh, perhaps also good to know about this. And um, I don't see anything happen, so I just continue talking. Um, uh, one of the uh, important parts here was that actually just before we were asked to conduct this evaluation was that the Dutch terrorism coordinator who is commissioning this facility already had secured the uh, finances for the upcoming years. So we were not coming in to see would the program continue or not, but actually they just got the security um, that the finances were safe for the next years. And then we came in to see how they could be more effectful or do a kind of assessment how effectful they were and then see uh, whether uh, this would uh, yeah, could, could be improved. And this also was uh, translated into the idea how we worked on this evaluation. Um, it was, uh, uh, we were actually, uh, um, the one who commissioned us was the exit facility. And we then had a board of, uh, an advisory board where also the judge terrorism coordinator, it was in together with academics uh, from different fields. Your microphone is off, Fanna, so even even that. <laughs> I'm in the meantime uh, sending the presentation to Norina, so that should uh, work yeah. a moment. Um, so Norina should have it. Norina, do you have the presentation? We'll just, we'll give it a minute. It'll arrive. <laughs> you see, it's because you tested it that it didn't work. This is the rules, the rules of play. Yeah.
So nothing just yet. Norina, do you want us to wait for a minute or shall we mm, try and pick up on a question and then return to Fenner and Martin's presentation? What we also could do, this is kind of invention, is to try to do it without presentation uh, because, well, we have very nice pictures, but I think the, the main thing is also we, we, could, we could tell it. If that's the better solution, please indicate. Yep. Uh, I'm just going to wait two ticks for Narina to give us an answer if she's received the presentation or if that's not worth waiting for. Yep. The uh, Martin and Fenner, do you want us to take the other questions first and wait for the so that you have your pictures to go along with your words? I either way. Uh by the way, I think I'm now sharing it, isn't it? Or... Well, there it is. I think so no. too, Martin. Perfect. Oh, <laughs> then I have some talents I never assumed before. Uh, please go ahead. All right, there we go. So sorry about that. Uh, we organize a lot of events as well. And uh, yeah, there's always a technical hip hiccup. But I'm sorry that it's us uh, this time. Uh, so thank you all for having us and thank you also for the interesting insights so far. I think uh, we are recognizing a lot of issues and challenges that, that were already raised. Uh, what we would like to do is uh, take you along in an actual evaluation we already conducted, uh, which Martin uh, just stressed. Um, and we will just give you a brief intro in, on the two programs that we evaluated how we uh, set it up in practice, and uh, Martin will share the lessons learned and recommendations uh, with you. Uh, so we work at Radar Advice, which is a consultancy firm in the social domain, um, and we uh, were tasked to evaluate uh, the two programs of the Dutch National Support Center on Countering Extremism. Uh, so they have two programs. Uh, one is called Family Support, uh, Support, and the name itself already says it. Um, they provide support in this program for families of radicalized individuals uh, and they also have an exit facility called Forza, uh, which focuses on adults and young people uh, who harbor extremist views or who are or have been involved in extremist networks. And for the sake of time, uh, we will only focus on the exit facility here. Um, so if you can go to the next one. Thank you. Uh, so I will briefly uh, show you uh, the setup of, of the, uh, the evaluation. On the right side, you see the research questions. I am not going to uh, read them all out loud, uh, but mainly uh, they were interested to know about the contributions to the intended objectives that they set of the exit facility. Uh, so basically getting an insight in the effectiveness of the program uh, and also about the effective elements in the program. Um, and what we did in order to reach that was uh, we conducted a literature research, both on uh, scientific uh, literature, but also on the working documents of the organization itself. Uh, we drafted a theory of change based on their documents. Uh, we created an evaluation framework, which will, I will show you uh, in the next slide. And uh, we then analyzed uh, the anonymous database of the organization and we held interviews with team members and participants and stakeholders. Um, and when I go to the evaluation framework, Martin, uh, this is how we tried uh, to actually, uh, yeah, get an insight in what we would like, to, uh, what we would actually like to measure. Uh, so with what indicators we measure whether the program reached uh, their intended goal? Well, on the left side, you see the objective of the program, which is strengthening protective factors in order to disengage from extremist violence or distancing 
uh, from an extremist network. Uh, and then we try to uh, come up with uh, all the points that we had to look at in order to say something about so, something meaningful about this. Uh, as you can see, we clustered it. Uh, the first five uh, clusters are based on the integration model of Burrell. Um, on, uh, as you can see, it's about social relations, ideology, resilience, action, orientation, and identity. And we then added the cluster of practical life areas as it was an important aspect of the work of, um, of the Dutch Center as well. Um, and based on the literature we reviewed, uh, we added uh, points to make these clusters even more concrete. Uh, and then, of course, uh, well, I can show you maybe one of them. I will not go into all of them. Uh, so, for example, the social relations, they have come up already a few times. Um, uh, we, for example, uh, researched whether uh, to what extent relationships with the families were improved or protective, to what extent links with the extremist networks were broken, uh, and to what extent positive and alternative social networks had emerged. So we didn't only look at recidivism, but also on all kinds of other points uh, that are meaningful. Uh, but of course, we couldn't say anything uh, about this without the data uh, that, that uh, was gathered and analyzed. And for that, I would like to give the floor to Martin. Yes, this is an example of uh, the database that was already existent. And this is to a large extent uh, based on the self-sufficiency matrix. And this database was filled in when people uh, came into the project and when it was finished. And so um, you see here uh, different numbers uh, on each row, like one, two, two, three. Um, one is that, it's, that people are completely self-sufficient on that aspect. And five, which is the maximum, is that they're completely self-insufficient uh, to handle things. And of course, if you would go from the uh, to the intake to uh, the closing uh, talks and see how people were um uh where, where we're scaled then you can see how many progress has been made i think it's important to say here because you see a lot of figures and that might sound like it's it's very mathematical but these are estimations made by the professionals so by the service providers themselves so there might also be um uh well well some uncertainties and at least it's not so sure as it looks like um, but we worked on this, especially for the more recent cases, because during time they started filling in this uh, database uh, from the uh, from the initial point. And um, in the earlier cases, they tried to restructure, but that was kind of problematic sometimes. Um, then lessons learned from the evaluation process we had is that we uh, say it's important to have a participatory and a cooperative approach. and. We really cooperated very close with the people of LSA, of the of the of the Dutch uh, of the of the Dutch Expertise Center, um, uh, also to get all the information from them, and also to see how they would be most helped by uh, the, uh, the the findings we had. Um, and one of the things we had here, and I think this is quite common, is that very often exit programs do start with a certain notion, but not really with a, a sound design. And so we had to rebuild the design uh, and, the, uh, and, uh, and therefore it was also good when doing this um, evaluation to first have the theory of change rearranged so that we would know where we were talking about. Um, then it was also, uh, like I just said, what is the right time? I think it was really good to have uh, it now. Now they just had a certainty that they would be fin financially safe so they could develop and improve um, in, 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 in a, well, in a, in a kind of safe modus. Um, and what is also good to realize is that uh, the, the all kinds of evaluation always will have uh, goals and impact and there are different learning interests for the different stakeholders and this is also what we what we saw like even ex in between the organization sometimes for the management the learnings they uh, they want to see out of it are different from the practitioners who are working with the people on the floor um, then what we, uh, uh, the second point, preparations for data registration, is 
what we have been trying to do is also to see, because what you just saw was a kind of assessment tool, but then to see what kind of interventions are being, uh, be, being performed and also what are the goals and can we categorize them? Uh, up till now, it was not really categorized. Um, and then, so what I just told you, we used the database, uh, the, null, the zero and the one measurements uh, to see if progress has been made. Um, and this, um, uh, yeah, th th this gave us a lot of information. Um, for the family support, where we will not go into, I have to say it was also much more difficult because there, there was the self-sufficiency matrix uh, is, is not being used. And in itself, uh, family support has many different target groups, being families who are afraid people leaving for uh, Daesh were in, but also people um, who had returnees, um, people who were living in the same house and felt the threat of violence and people living distant. So the circumstances were much different. When we come to the general recommendations we made to the judge center, and I think also things that are quite general, is that um, to have concrete uh, success indicators for matters um, is needed because we just showed you the chart we were looking at, um, given from the literature and uh, also for, uh, following the model of Burrell. And then we saw that for some of these fields, we didn't find sufficient information yet in the uh, database, which is used now mostly based on the self-sufficiency matrix. Um, and then we also said work on uniformity of the registration. Um, the people very often are um, just were, well, actually in the initially were just filling things out for themselves because it was their own dossier they worked on with their clients. So they did write down things that were useful for them to remember when they would see them the next time. And if you want to work on effect evaluation based um, on this database, you would have also have more uh, need of more uh, uniform uh, registration. Um, then also, uh, it would be good not only to do this once or uh, in a few years uh, by an external uh, partner, but also to see if you could have qu quarterly overviews to see the progress and if you are uh, doing uh, well. And like I just already said, for family support, there's even more data needed to have a good sound uh, information on their effectivity. Then coming to mid and longer term, um, I just already mentioned that there's not an overview of the interventions yet uh, per program. So apart from uh, seeing the results, it's also good to see why you are using certain interventions to get into some results. The data set could be further be uh, developed. Um, it's also clear division between the intake and the traject phase. That might be a technical one, but also referring to the uh, quote that I think the former speaker just said about Curler, about what is the success rate. Very often you, it's also defining when you would start measuring if something is impactful. If you people have to go through three or four hurdles before starting the program, also the chance that they will have a positive outcome is, of course, bigger than if you just would say the first informal contact with a potential client would be measured. Then the need for contact, collecting and collecting data on long-term impact. Now it was really difficult. We only had um, impact uh, measures when people were stopping with the uh, process within uh, the de-radicalization program, so not one year after or two years. We had some interviews with people, but this was on a voluntary basis and also people who still want to be in contact with the facility. Then it would be important also more to include uh, if there's any gender specific items into it and also how we could more work more on non-Islamist extremism as actually this facility was first built up for Islamist extremism. Meanwhile, it's also open for extreme right and, for example, also an anti-state of the government, but it's still very much based on Islam, uh, the Islamist ideology. And then finally is um, also that you should make your other stakeholders more aware of your competences and of the way you work, because what we saw with some of the other stakeholders was that they didn't expect um, the Dutch Expertise Center to work so systematically. And this really could be an add-on and also um, increase the feeling of uh, reliability and the image of being a very professional organization within the field. 
So that would uh, finish our uh, presentation. Again, uh, apologies for the hiccup and open to all your questions. That was great. Thank you very much, Martin Fenner. And uh, that was really brought us into back into reality with the technical details of data collection, um, as well as how useful a data set like that could be. To all our speakers, thanks once again. Um, we've had a whole 360-degree uh, look around um, the evaluation of exit programs, and now it's time to hand over to our very patient uh, listeners in this session um, to respond to their questions. Perhaps we could take Emma's two questions first. Um, Victor is ah, uh, gosh. There they all are. I'm not going to uh, read them out unnecessarily. I think these were directed at you, uh, Pedro and Victor, for your session. Am I correct? Yes, I think so. I can I can address Emma's question. Um, Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, first of all, for the interesting question. So when you talk about the impossible of measuring a negative. As I briefly explained, we are um, talking about a situation in which basically we don't know what will be the outcome in the absence of the intervention. So ideally in uh, uh, experimental research, we will have a group of participants and we will randomly assign them to an experimental condition and a control group. Um, this is needed to understand the causality, so if the intervention caused the outcome, being it the desired change, the disengagement, the radicalization, and so on. So this is a limitation that is really difficult to address in these kind of populations, um, almost, I would say, impossible to solve. And therefore, I think that we should um, increase the validity of our evaluations and of our interventions with other strategies. And um, of course, measuring uh, and work on the protective factors, the social support, the family support, the uh, successful reintegration. I would say it is advisable and a way to have more information about the participants. Um, However, and that being said, uh, this does not solve the attribution problem, right? So uh, we still uh, don't know if without implementing the intervention, uh, if uh, uh, the positive or negative outcome will occur, okay? But yes, it is important to measure uh, and we should consider measuring the protective factors. Thanks, Victor. Emma, does that answer your question? Perhaps you can catch us up in the chat later. To our, um, to our participants who've requested uh, the presentations, we're just waiting for a response on that. And as far as I can see, um, we are up to date with all the questions then that have been posted by people. Yeah, that was the second half of Emma's question, which I think you responded to as well, Victor. We're up to date with everything that everybody posted in the Q&A session. So speakers, between yourselves, do you have anything that you would have, any reactions or queries from each other's presentations that you'd like to um, take up now that we have some time? Maybe just a short thought on, on the question about um, that we don't have a group to, to check if the impact of exit programs was there or not. So I think the same question we could also ask about social work. So we have social work and, and we know social work in general works. So there's more inclusion, there's more participation and all that kind of good stuff for young people. and. On the other hand, we don't we don't have a chance to check um, at the same time what is without social work and not. So with a uh, group to compare. 
So I think um, if we if we think about to evaluate um, exit programs, we have to, and that's but also that's also a problem from the GDPR. Um, we have to go very deep into the process of development um, from the person himself. That's very difficult, um, but we also had some experiences and we had done this before. So, and we are in the lucky situation that we are an old project. So we, we, we exist since 20 years. So it was easy for us to say, okay, speak to this person and we ask them and say, okay, I will do so. And then you will have these long-term progress and you see, okay, the person is exiting maybe 2011 and he's still out of the movement and you see all that development so but if you just have a project which is working for two three five years you can't see that kind of progress and um, real um, development there so that's a big problem but i think there are other ways to 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 measure success so case related is there any violence against the person is there any security threat for the person is there an involvement in different kind of um working fields or progress in, in, in education whatever i think there's a lot of different um possible ways to to measure that success even if you can't uh, uh, have the whole picture at least and i think there's also um, a lot of stuff done from the radicalization awareness network before so there are publications around this from practitioners which are sharing some good experiences um with evaluation and we had also good and bad evaluations or more good or bad experiences with evaluation and every time a long-term process of discussing the goal and discussing the um the ways of, of measuring um this kind of success fair points Fabian and I think you you're going quite deep into the observation of changes there as well aren't you uh, well, at least touching on anybody wants to come back on that yes I I think I I agree uh, on that what uh, Fabio just brought across and I think it's also um, still quite a challenge to see people are asking how big is, big is the effect of um, of a program then people are always wanting a hundred percent cure and what we also saw in the research we did is that we saw some progress being made, but perhaps people being not self-sufficient yet. So they came from a long way, but you still saw there was a need of, fur of further help. Uh, but then it's end of contract of this project. So you should also forward this to, to social workers or to a youth worker, or perhaps even to a mosque or just, just mention it. Um, and this is one of the difficult parts, I think, with exit work very often is that we expect a 100% clean person out of uh, the de-radicalization and disengagement machine. And that's fully impossible also because we also know that very often people who got into radicalization already had their vulnerability. So it's even more, uh, uh, it's, it's a stranger thing to expect that they will, will, will be the model citizens of the future. Yes, I could just <laughs> jump again in, but um, yeah, I think it's an important point. So you you, you meet people at different uh, or in different situations. So you you, you meet people in, in prison, you meet people outside of prison with different kind of problems, um, but also with different levels of, of reflection. So and also different situation in, 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 in case of because of their security situation. So is there a threat or not? Is there time for reflection or is there just time to, to think about how to secure their own life because of a threat from the, the group? So, and if you look at these different situations in which people are in, you will find or you will have different uh, results in an evaluation. So we need this time to evaluate this. So it, yeah, maybe it, Need, need more than, than four or five years to evaluate something like this. And then there's another thing like, um, and what I think it's quite interesting, if I work with a person, my, my major goal is that the person, um, yeah, will take my idea. So maybe I would say, okay, please let, let us think about doing it that way or doing it like this. And at the end, I don't like people saying, Okay, I don't want to hear people saying, I did this because Fabian said to me I should to do this like this. 
that's the wrong way. So the best way would be people said, okay, yeah, I understand, I do it like this. And if you evaluate something like this, um, at the end, people would say, yeah, I did this because um, I thought that's the right way. Um, and then there's the question, what is the role of someone who is counseling that process? So um, empowering people to find the right way to find their own decisions. Um, it's quite difficult to evaluate because at least they will they, they will feel like it's, it was my decision, it was my idea. And that's the goal for me to say that people feel like, okay, that decision was my decision. That's the right decision. And I'm just someone who is helping to, to find that kind of decision. And I think that's also another problem for evaluation of this uh, um, progress in, in, in exit work. If I may echo uh, back to Fabian, um, before taking him a uh, question, I guess one thing that at least I see in the field, or one challenge uh, that I see in the field is that um, we ask intervention providers to do as tailor-made approaches as possible. This is something that is suggested, and a lot of intervention providers do it. At the same time, with the um, um, with this uh, task to evaluate, monitor, etc., we also move to a standardization of processes, tools, etc. And I have a feeling that there are some organizations who have put these two things together and who, who, who can function and manage these, these two things at the same time, which are separate things. But there are also organizations who um, find it difficult to put this standardization and tailor-made very unique processes together. And I guess this is something that maybe we need to discuss further um, in, in research, but also among practitioners and policymakers, how to put these two things together. It's a really good point, Heidi. Thanks very much for jumping in there. Could we take, um, before we come to your point, uh, Robert, could we take Emma's uh, question about the language around success? I think this also, um, chimes with your um, new shared vocabulary issue. So uh, you um, or anybody else want to come back on this question from Emma about the language around success? It, fair enough, it would have to be a pretty quick answer. So. Yeah. I do understand your hesitation. Rian, <laughs> Rian, and if you want, I can I can address it because uh, exactly when when Martin was mentioning also the fact that uh, uh, we are talking about uh, one hundred percent success, meaning zero recidivism, for example, and in fact, of course, we can uh, even if we uh, were able to do an experimental study, uh, we are always talking in the context of uh, confidence intervals and uh, levels of confidence. So, yes, uh, it will be uh, more appropriate to talk about um, a certain level of confidence that an outcome will occur or will not occur instead of uh, talking about success and failure as... Um, Two, two opposite poles, right, of completely success or complete failure. Fantastic. Thanks, Victor. We have just a couple of minutes for the end of the session um, as we are uh, asked to, uh, us to finish session one or two minutes early. There are two questions from Robert Orell in the chat. Is there a specific area of focus that is the most important for ex organizations to address in the evaluation? And how can exit organizations navigate between the different types of evaluations? Quick round from speakers. Um, if you want to answer one or, or both of the questions in a minute or so, please go ahead. Shall I pick on someone to start? I can do that. Okay, Fenner. Sure, I can start. Thank you. Um, well, when it comes to where exit program should start when thinking of evaluation, uh, it's a difficult one, at least 
it is important that that they already at the beginning of their program they start thinking about evaluation of course but uh, what they should exactly uh, do is of course especially when you start uh, quite challenging especially as robert is mentioning i think yeah um that a smaller organization or when you're just starting you often have more limited staff and resources um but i would say what you can do is not start with a full-on evidence-based evaluation but start with thinking about what your objectives are what you want to achieve and start for example with a peer review um for example i know uh, that within the radicalization awareness network uh, the the peer review manual has been uh, created with a lot of questions to think about in advance to uh, start uh, discussions among colleagues on where to improve or between organizations for example and i think that would be sort of the first starting point to pick up on this when you don't have any time to allocate to this which is for a lot of people the case i think Great answer. Pedro? Yeah, and that was also going to, I'm also going a bit back to the previous question by Hema on this. Uh, actually, what we've seen also from the from the respondents in our study during the evaluation is that we, we are not implementing any evaluation procedures because these were not a part of the con bu budgetary concept when we intended to, to do this kind of program. So it we only focus on the implementation per se, and we have not foreseen any funds for evaluation. So, uh, and so in that part, I will also go not in the beginning, but even the conceptualization of the whole program and the whole approach. Um, I will also mention that uh, uh, and, and and emphasize the need probably for to to re to to change the terminology that we are using from success to failure because uh, one of the uh, I remember particularly one of the of the directors of one exit program mentioning that uh, actually we do not know if, uh, if if our approach is being successful and I'm not sure if you want to uh, because we are a bit afraid of the evaluation outcomes and that will mean that we will lose our jobs so also here bring moving from a terminology from success to failure to degrees of confidence etc can be also interesting to sensitize and heighten the attention for policymakers and decision makers that if something is not working 100% does not mean that the pro program should end uh, uh, per se at that moment. And there are new other ways to, to evaluate this as also Vitor highlighted in the, according to the objectives that we intend to achieve as also Fena mentioned in the, in the, in the previous answer, yeah. So excellent point. Um, and thanks, uh, Fabian or Heidi. I, I would uh, just like to. Ah, so can I some first? Final, some final okay. thoughts? Uh, yes. Um, um, uh, together with uh, John Morrison, Andrew Silk, and two other researchers, we did a systematic review some um, time ago uh, on exit programs. And uh, one of the results was that uh, although we do not know what kind of methods work and why and to whom, particularly, we see that working together doing the intervention is useful. So, uh, so I guess this is maybe something that um, we can start growing our things on or take this as, as, as the first step things, to, uh, as something that we can like, as a, as the right word, something that we can uh, like move forward. So uh, at the moment we, um, we do see that uh, that in, like working together, and what my interviews have told me as well is that they do see that this human connection and doing activities together is something that um, that matters. So perhaps, although from the evaluation side it might it might might sound stupid, but maybe we should put more emphasis on the process, not the result. Mm -hmm. Excellent point, and it might be one we have to end on, Fabian and Marty about. 10 seconds to add your final point. Yeah, yeah, very quick. Um, just also on the process, just looking on the internal processes, the protocols, if there's just a short time of the program or the project, um, just having a look how the program is prepared to do something, to help in uh, how it's networked uh, into different areas. So um, I think that's easily, could easily done um, in evaluation. Um, also, if there's not a big uh, um, pool of cases, so, but you could see 
if there are is there the structure and the structure is um uh, uh um problem uh, related so that could be also something to evaluate at least thank you so much martin <laughs> i'm sorry no <laughs> problem do it, do it very brief what i really think is important is that if other exit programs are also presenting how they did their effect evaluation that you can learn from this and in this sense i was really glad that the Dutch Expertise Center was really wanting to have their uh, evaluation completely online so that you can check it. And also, if you need inspiration that you can get from it, we see very often that people are being very secretive and sometimes this is needed due to GDPR things, but a lot of the method methodology we are using, I think we could share more easily. You have been wonderful. And I think a testament to your really interesting presentations is that we are now slightly over time. So thank you very much and uh, congratulations to all the speakers and see you back in the final session shortly, which is charting the way forward for the Indeed project and for all of us. Thanks again to the speakers and to our audience here tonight. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>